always love to hear from you. Send us your views, comments, and videos with your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 081-200-6659 or send an SMS to 555. One Africa TV, it just gets better. you were surprised with this strange photo. And polydactyly is a genetic disorder. Now I want to do a bit of revision, not on genetics, but how did it come that this strange thing happened? Did you see? One, two, three, four, five, six fingers. Five fingers and a thumb. So when we know where does all the codes come from for your body to know how many fingers to produce, it is in your DNA. So if there is something wrong in the DNA, it can be either in the gene code or there can be a chromosome. We call that a I hear you, a mutation. So in the code of this person's DNA, there was a mistake that told this body to build six fingers, a gene mutation. People inherit an extra digit. The X-ray image shows the left hand of someone with polydactyly. The person has six digits, five fingers and one thumb. Polydactyly is a dominant allele. Now we have to start paying attention. What is important to look for when you are doing a genetic problem? We want to know which one is dominant. And they give us the symbol for the dominant allele. The table describes the different genetic types for polydactyly. Complete the table by giving the correct genotype. So we know, need to know there's a difference between genotype, what is written on the genes. Now, and on the genes we have letters. So, homozygous dominant means capital D, capital D. And they gave us, there will be six. Interesting that this gene notation is dominant. Homozygous is small d, small d, and there will be five. Because five fingers is the recessive trait. And heterozygous will then be capital D, small d, and there will be six. There will be six fingers. The table lists possible mating between parents. Complete the table by writing the probability of each mating producing a child with polydactyly. So we want now to... First, do a little Punnett square. Perhaps you can do this because you know your rules. If you are not sure, quickly draw a Punnett square. Nah, that will be capital D, capital D, capital D, capital D, capital D, small d, and capital D, small d. So, in this case, there will be a one 
point zero probability. In this one, capital D, capital D. I, I, what is now happening with this? Let me just push up a bit and small d, small d. So here we will have one, two, three. Three out of four is 0 0.75. Now, is the probability for to have a child with polydactyly? Okay, then we have cystic fibrosis. And I think we have skipped now. Uh, sorry, hemophilia is an inherited condition. And again, that is also a mutation. The recessive allele is a small h. And it's carried on the x. So the moment when you read x chromosome, you know it is X for six, ne? X six linked disorder. Now I cannot use the H. The H is not dominant. The H is six linked, so I need to have a, an X in my answer, ne? I need to have an X. So they gave me the father and the mother. The first question, the mother is a carrier. What is meant by a carrier? The mother does not show the symptoms. But one of the alleles is the hemophilia allele. That can be transferred to her offspring. If the mother and the father had children, what are the four possible genotypes that could result? And now use a genetic diagram. You cannot skip this part because zero marks even if everything is correct. That's my first thing that I want to tell you. You have to know this by heart. You have to know this. template by heart and do it like that first thing second thing is remember it does not mean that they are going to have if they have four children one will look like that one will look like that no it is with each conception there is a probability to have one of this children with each conception. Do you understand that? Please ask me if you do not. So we need to write down the parental phenotype. It's a normal father with a carrier of hemophilia mother. You must remember the cross there. Then we write down the genotypes. Sex link X, XH because the father is normal and the Y a little dot or dash because there is no such an allow on the Y chromosome. And crossing, and there is the mother. The gametes have to be in a circle. Don't say afterwards, oh, no. Nah. This is now where if you are not concentrating, that you will miss this. Good. Now we need fertilization, and if... It happens so that this sperm and this ovum in this conception, we will, would have had an XH and an XH. You see? Then if this sperm and this ovum, we would have had X capital H, XH. If this was the sperm and this was the ovum, X capital H, Y dash. And the last one, X small h, Y dash. Because there is not an allow on the Y. Now, 
Remember, sex link means there is a difference between boys and girls. Now, so these two will be girls, and these two will be boys. So read the question carefully. Do they ask boys? Do they ask children? Okay. So our question was. What are the four possible genotypes? And actually, there our answer stops now. But just to study some more, the phenotype will then be. You have to write down. Let me just mark that. Um, okay. We will have a normal. And you have to write down go. That will be a carrier go. That will be a boy, and it will be a normal boy. And this will be, unfortunately, a hemophiliac boy. Nah. So this. Uh, pair will have a possibility of 25 percent, or 0.25, or one to three ratio to have a child with hemophilia. Okay, cystic fibrosis. Oh, we have terrible situations and conditions here on this test. Cystic fibrosis is also an inherited disease. The allele for cystic fibrosis is recessive to the normal allele, and they use a C. Approximately one person in every 25 are carriers of the recessive allele. So do you remember what is cystic fibrosis? The mucus becomes sticky. Again, the code on the DNA that must ma give the recipe to make the protein inside the mucus is wrong. It is mutated. And therefore, it now comes out as a sticky mucus. That sticky mucus makes it un impossible to take up the oxygen by the blood. It can also hamper the digestive enzymes in the ducts of the pancreas. So breathing is difficult, not enough oxygen, getting very tired because respiration cannot take place, and then also digestion very slow. That may lack the glucose and the energy molecules in the cells for respiration to release energy. Good. Then the symbols to give the person who suffers. If you suffer, you are homozygous recessive. And I'm going to try and just... I, uh, let me just try and increase the size. And now mark it through. Let me just stop. Ay. Color blindness is usually a genetic condition. Red, green, blue color blindness is usually passed on down from your parents. The gene which is responsible for the condition is carried on the X. X means sex linked. Yes. A Punnett square. And I want to show you fully labeled. So everything that you had on your genetic diagram, everything that we have written down there, must be in your Punnett square for your marks. So if they say genetic diagram, I think it is better to use this one 
than the Punnett square because it's difficult to have all this on your genetic diagram. If they specifically ask for a Punnett square, please remember to do it like this. So we first start out with the um, the parents, and we always have the mum on top and the dad on the side, right? Then we need to put circles around the gametes, okay? And what bothers me here is that where do I write down the phenotypes? So write down the phenotypes of the parents somewhere so that they see you know that too. And then we have the word gametes, we have the word fertilization. Here we show this is actually our lines of fertilization. Now, and in the squares, I have written the genotype and the phenotype, just to make sure they have everything. Please do it neat and use as large space as they have given to you. They normally do not ask the Punnett square. I always use the Punnett square on the side just to check because I get a bit confused with all those spider webs of the fertilization lines. Now, you, but you know me. So we have a normal vision mother. So actually they gave the phenotypes. And a colorblind father. A colorblind father. A normal vision mother. And a colorblind father. A normal vision mother and a can have, can have. So if they can have a son with normal vision and a colorblind daughter, I know that this normal vision mother was a heterozygous. She was a carrier of the colorblind gene. And there I give my answers. A normal vision son, because the son gets his X from the mother and his Y from the father. On the Y there are no allows. So from his mother, the son can inherit a normal allow, and there can be a possibility that the son can be colorblind because he can inherit that gene from his mother. Because the father cannot mask off that gene, they can also be a colorblind son. Good. And that was our test. Please look at the attachment that I add to just have a list of common mistakes that had been made. Um, and please, grade 12s, keep on working hard. Start with revision for your exam. That will be shortly after school reopens, maybe in June, maybe in August. But you know we are writing grade 11 and grade 12, and we are positive. We want to be the best we can. Why? For yourself, to be proud of yourself, to pass this year. Thank you, great. Insurance is the best safety net you can buy yourself. It is something good you do for yourself because should anything happen to any of your assets, you will be okay. 
Luckily, it also doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg. More affordable yet still reliable options are available in Namibia. The right insurer will get you financially prepared for accidents or emergencies with insurance for your phone, car, buildings or your business. Let the Good Deal Namibia help you stretch your dollar by directing you to the one insurer that promises decreased premiums the longer you are insured. For a quote, simply SMS insure to triple five and we will call you back. When the live game's about to start, but you're stuck here, we've got an app for that. Missing your favorite show because the fridge is running low? We've got an app for that. Stuck watching what she wants to watch? We've got an app for that. Waiting for the bus? App for that. Working late? App for that. And if the power goes out, we've got an app for that too. All for you. The DSTV Now app is the entertainment solution for anything life can throw at you. Simply download the app from your app store and add your DSTV account information to activate the app and start watching. Whenever, wherever you have a charged device and an internet connection, you have DSTV Now. Share with us on hashtag learn on one. Tell us what you're learning and where you're learning it from. Send us your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 081-200-6659 or send an SMS to triple five. One Africa TV, it just gets better. We always love to hear from you. Send us your views, comments, and videos with your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 081-200-6659 or send an SMS to triple five. One Africa TV, it just gets better. And the first thing that needs to happen <coughs> is conception or fertilization. And we know, ah, write the date and write in pencil. What is the definition of fertilization? So it is the fusion of the nucleus of the Ovum, or the egg cell, that's fine, with the nucleus of the sperm, and it forms a zygote. Now, I just want you to add in brackets an N. Or well, you said haploid, and then I want you to add diploid zygote. It's the nucleus of the Sperm fusing with the nucleus of the ovum, both are haploid, forming a diploid zygote. Okay, now isn't this absolutely amazing? While, while I was looking at this video, I thought, how is it possible that maybe I can understand the swimming of the sperm and all that stuff, but think of that, that spindles that forms inside, that fibers, and all those chromosomes that just move. I mean, how do that structure of DNA knows to move and form this uh, it's, it's so amazing that I'm really now goosebumps all over me, and this is not the first time that I saw this video. But it is so amazing. And I know that you know that little story of you are a winner just to become an embryo. 
because it is how many millions of sperm that was fighting for the first prize. Yeah. And that one that was is that is part of you yeah, is was the fastest. Okay? Endure all that things on its root. So it was a fast sperm. It was a good sperm. Okay, so that is actually absolutely amazing if we think about that. <coughs> so we understand that um, ejaculation needs to take place and there are lots, millions of sperm and there need to be an egg in the oviduct. Process where the egg is released, ovulation, which day of, on the 14th day, which hormone is at its highest? LH, LH for ovulation. Nah. Although follicle stimulating hormone is also high, but the high one, the one that causes ovulation, LH, luteinizing hormone. And we saw that it is not an easy talk for the sperm to reach the egg. Um, I, I just want to talk about the, it can even get attacked by the female's white blood cells. Nay, we saw that. And there's an acidic environment. That is important for the female reproductive organ to have an acidic environment. Because remember, it's an opening towards the environment. So, like pathogens can enter in your nose, pathogens can enter through the vagina. And that is why it needs to be an acidic environment to prevent pathogens, like bacteria and fungi, to enter um, through the vagina into the body of a female. But if you remember, there was three different glands in the male. It was the cowper's glands, the prostate gland, and there was another one, the, sp sperm, the sperm vesicles. And they secrete substances. Quickly look up which one was the one that... Um, make sure to neutralize the acidic environment. Seminal vesicles, ne? Mobile, prevent drying out, glands also make the semen alkaline. Ne? Now we understand why it needs to be alkaline. Okay, to neutralize. <coughs> right. I just want to make sure, do you know the difference between semen and sperm? Semen is sperm plus all the fluids from the three glands. That is the semen. The whole bunch is the semen. Okay. Sperm is only the male gamete. We remember that. Good. Okay. And then we know once the egg is located, we saw it very clearly how the only one can enter, and we have the fusion of the two nuclei. And there will be a, a fence or a border prevented help, with help by the zona pellucida to prevent any other sperm to enter there. Oh, sorry, the wrong side. Okay, so the acrosome holds the digestive enzymes in the head of the sperm for digesting its way through. Now, let's quickly talk about twins or multiple births. We have two types, monozygotic or dizygotic. Monozygotic is when I have one egg and the egg divides one egg, so it was one sperm, one ovum, and it makes a ball from the outer part. It looks like a soccer ball with all these parts. And then all at a specific stage, it divides into two. 
but still exactly the same genetic material. Identical twins. Dizygotic means there was two eggs. So because of a surge or a high level of follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone, they actually it must be follicle stimulating because there is where the egg um, forms and develops, and then we have a fraternal twin. And that is those twins that are boy or girl. It will be a, a boy if you have a boy and a girl twin. They must be fraternal. Eh? Otherwise, they would have been the same gender. Or when you can clearly see, they do not look alike. Like Nina and Luca also. They don't look alike. But if you remember, any can Kaidin, I think they are monozygote. I, uh, they say they don't think they are. I remember. We had a discussion when they did this. But, so we do understand now what, how twins forms. The <clears throat> one zygote splits in two. No one knows why. Completely randomly. And they say it does not run in the family. But they will have same exact DNA, and um, they will be a clone of, by nature. Now, and then the fraternal twins is where we have two separate eggs. I think we do understand that one. Of course, we can have conjoint twins, and that is where a few parts of the cell separated and developed, but some of the cells stay together. And many times, like this one, they have like one set of lungs or one set of digestive organs, perhaps two lungs, and then they cannot separate them. Sometimes it's two bodies, only a little bit attached, and they separate it with an operation. But... Many times it's not possible. And there are examples of conjoined twins. And I think it's, it is very interesting because, you know, you cannot get angry of each, each other. You can never get away from each other. Yeah, this is um, something very rare. Ne? Okay, so here we see how the zygote starts to develop. Two ball, four ball, eight ball. That one they call a murula. Ne? And then the cell starts to move in a circle with uh, an opening in the middle. And then that opening folds in. <coughs> oh, sorry. That opening folds in and there we have the development that inner cell mass will start to develop and forms the fetus. So we have a layer of cells surrounding a group of cells in the middle. And this group of cells on the outer part will become the amnion sac. Amnion sac is like a bag. And those cells also attach to the outer layer of the uterus. The moment when this cell implants into, implants into it, they join and they are set. And then we have this further development inside the endometrium. The, the layer inner lining of the uterus, endometrium. Okay. Endometrium, outer lining of the uterus, and this part where the mother cells and the cells of the embryo join, that will become the placenta. The placenta will be the spot where the exchange must take place. Because this little embryo, which soon will be called a fetus, yes, do not have any means of getting food, 
besides getting it from its mother. So there must be a link. No. <laughs> and um, I just want you to I uh, just want you to show you now this joining of the embryo cells and uterus cells forms like a disc and this disc we call the placenta now starts to act as an endocrine gland. Endocrine gland, no ducts, secretes hormones directly into the blood. And estrogen will be secreted and progesterone will be secreted. Why estrogen? Builds up the wall. No. This wall needs to be built up more and more as the embryo develops. So prepares the uterus eventually for labor and the lining of the vagina must become thicker and better supplied with blood. The progesterone keep the endometrium thick. It inhibits the uterus wall to contract. We know that the moment when progesterone drops, we had menstruation. So during the pregnancy, the progesterone must stay at high levels. And remember, there was something that stopped. FSH was not released. There is no FSH uh, forming a follicle. So there can be no progesterone coming from the ovaries now. Okay, so something else must take the role to make progesterone. And as long as the progesterone levels are high, the uterus wall will not contract. Any contractions of the uterus wall will start labor um, to happen. Now, prevents menstruation, prevents ov ovulation, and it will also stimulate the development of the breasts because after nine months, there must be milk provided for the baby that has been born. The placenta, from the mother's side, it's a, there's a spongy part, a thickened part, thickened part, and it forms a disc. And on the fetus side, we see villi. Now, you remember, I always show you villi. Where did we find villi? Who can remember? In the small intestine. And it was a finger-like extension to increase the surface area. Now, <coughs> here, we also see a finger-like extension into the uterus. So some of this, there's a space with an opening and this fingers will, the blood vessels will then come from the mother and from the fetus, but they will never at attach to each other. It looks like this. So here's the mother, mother blood, mother's blood come and it flows into this placenta, open space. The fetus has this fingers and it's in between. And we need the exchange of nutrients by diffusion between these two. That never ever will the mother's blood flow into the little fetus. And I will give you the reasons now. Let's just quickly look at this. So this is now after implantation. Now we see that little dot of a fused nucleus now becomes the shape of the embryo. No? And we can think that there may be, there can be a human there. No? Sort of look like that. Do you know that the embryo of a a uh, pig and a bird, a chicken, little chicken, and a human. At a specific stage, they look exactly the same. Exactly the same, yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> what? Okay, so that yolk sac is before this attachment has been finished. 
In the yolk, there are nutrients to feed the cells. We know that no cell can function or develop without energy. So that yolk sac will bring nutrients to the cells. Okay, and, and then you can see there is a bag. That bag is the amnion or the amnion sac. And inside there is fluid, amnion, amniotic fluid. And yes, that bag needs to open. We will get to all those functions. I just want to show you, now there we see the little uh, fetus. Here we see the umbilical cord. And now it's very clear how we developed. Now there is a bag surrounding and there you see what I call the villi. Now, so there's a space. Mother's blood is the red in the picture. I made you this picture. And the fetus is in this space. Okay. Here it is enlarged. So if we look at here, uh -huh. I, I actually summarized what is in your book. So you will see I had little ways of how to help you to remember. So check, because this is something that has lots of information. Watch now. There's two arteries from the fetus to the placenta. From the fetus to the placenta, two arteries. One vein from the placenta back to the fetus. Uh. You, I think, you, I can see you think, rarig. is that important? Yes, it is. Because they give you this drawing and they ask you to label which is the artery, which is the vein. Ne? So artery, two, from fetus in that direction, two. Artery always away from the heart. So I think it like this. This little fetus has a heart that pumps. If it's Pumping, it needs to pump away from it. Artery to, away to the placenta. Now, one vein coming in. Okay, let's continue there. Two arteries, one vein. Never mix. Now I want you to think, what is the reason why the mother and the baby can have different blood groups? Pathogens. If there are pathogens in the mother's blood and it is directly pumped into a little fetus ne, that do not have an immune system yet, there will be problems. And then there's a third thing. It is pressure. Can you think how hard the mother, the, the little fetus has a heart that is the size of my pinky now? No? So what is the pressure in that little, very small? Now the mother has a huge heart and that blood is under much higher pressure. If that is being pumped into the blood vessels of the little fetus, it will burst or explode. Now, so there I have my three reasons. Please remember them in pink. Blood groups can differ. The pressure in the mother's vessels are too high, and they can be pathogens. So then we say that the placenta turns into an endocrine gland to, what do you think the O and the P is for? Estrogen and progesterone. Good. Now the, we need substances to be exchanged from the mother to the fetus, and there are three. What do you think will the fetus need from the mother? Oxygen? Okay, glucose, amino acids, amino acids, not proteins, amino acids, okay, oxygen, nutrients, and number three, antibodies. That can move over this division. So when the little baby is born, it cannot fight for itself. And what do we call that type of immunity? Okay. So 
important three. That is important three points there, you see. And these three also important. Now, yanas, yes, they are waist in the in the fetus. You, yes. Okay, because now it's fine while the, the it is a fe in the fetus shape, but when it becomes a baby, it means it is born and it is immediately delivered to uh, un an unfriendly environment. And that is to help. No. Okay. <coughs> right. So what type of waste? CO2 and urea. Will need to get from the little fetus to the mother. And then the placenta also act as a barrier. No. Okay, this is the waste. It acts as a barrier between the uterus and the fetus. Okay. Yeah, between, so it's a, it forms a barrier for the fetus to stay on one part and on the other part you will have the uterus which actually belongs to the mother. Yeah, the placenta belongs to both. Actually. Okay. Right. Then we look at the umbilical cord. You, in your book, page 447, and there is where I said they give you that picture and you have to say which is artery, what happens in the artery, which is vein. Blood vessels from the placenta to the baby, one vein from the placenta to the fetus, two arteries from the fetus to the placenta, and the ba mom's and baby's blood do not circulate together. We already said that. Now look the amniotic sac. And now we are back at your question of being in an accident. Now, so if we have this membrane surrounding the baby, it secretes, the membrane secretes the amniotic fluid and it prevents entry from pathogens. Any pathogens, because pathogens will not stay only in blood. Pathogens can enter through any cells of the body. Now, so this sac prevents the entry of the pathogen. As we said, when the water breaks, it actually means the amniotic sac opened, ruptured. And it needs to break open so that the baby can Exit through the birth canal. Birth canal, cervix plus vagina. Let me help you. While the, while the baby is inside the amniotic fluid, this amniotic fluid already moves into the lungs and out of the lungs and so it starts to develop. And then when the baby is coming out, that pathway closes. And those, those, it, it actually, while it's being born, it's moving out. All the liquids, all the liquid move out. The baby is swallowing also. The baby is swallowing the amniotic fluid to help with the practicing of the peristalsis. And <clears throat> it's all the liquid that is in this opening. But remember, this opening stays closed. You know, the eyes stays like closed for a long, long period. And then, this is how amazing it is. There's a specific enzyme at a specific stage of development. So if this and this and this and this is developed, then there's an enzyme that come and cut open the eyes. The eyes are closed all the time because there's nothing to see. Yeah? And then all of a sudden there's an enzyme cutting open the membrane so I think that it's the same as the na nasal, you know, but when you swallow, I'm not sure exactly, I, I will have to do some research, but this will also be closed until a specific time. But you can also, like you can breathe in, so perhaps the, in the, the epiglottis also keeps the lungs closed while swallowing the amniotic fluid. I'm just thinking 
what can help. Nay. So we will have to read up. I have a lot of videos that showing the development, but I am I can't remember all that detail now. So um, here we are with your question. The water makes a buoyant cradle for the baby. It protects against any shock, gravity, pressure, and temperature. Ne? Um, the urine also goes into the, the, into the amniotic fluid. It prevents drying out, and it's sterile, preventing pathogens, cleaning it, and it allows free movement. But this part is for me very important for you to remember. Listen, listen. You are all going to be mums and dads. Ne? And development is through movement. So that little fetus inside starts to develop its brain due to the free movement that the fetus has inside. You must. The more movement you have inside there, the more development you have. Okay. Um, if the mother is very, very still, the baby will be very still. The mom needs to keep moving. Because remember, the first movement inside the uterus, now this is now very interesting stuff, this is now mind move stuff, that baby, the moment when you move, the baby moves, although it is a passive movement, but that passive movement is, oh, this is so cool, listen to this, the baby has tiny little hairs, much more than when it's born, covered with. So as you move and the baby hops and jumps there inside, the amniotic fluid is massaging the little hairs. This hairs send information to the brain and that's all that we want. We want information to the brain. This is a baby, six to seven months. Okay, let's continue. Let's get birth so that we can look at some videos. 280 days after fertilization. So that is 40 weeks after the last menstruation or 38 weeks after conception. Now because two we you have menstruation, two weeks later you had ovulation. If you conceived, you know that word conceived, it means you fertilization or conception took place. <coughs> That is two weeks later. So if you want to count, 40 weeks after the last menstruation, or 38 weeks, that is how long you need to be pregnant for the perfect development of the little fetus. What will happen with a 30-week-old fetus? There's eight weeks. It Depends, is that 30 weeks from conception or from, but let's say it's the how old the fetus is. Now, that means there's a lot of development that didn't take place. And from week 34 to week 38, it's actually the crucial development for the brain. So, so what is the problem? Of course it will develop, it will continue when the baby is born early, but now the baby has to conquer lots of other environmental problems. Nah. Breathe, movement, um, sounds that is not, he, he or she is not aware of. And that, yeah, seeing, yes, yeah, seeing lots of stuff. But you see, so now the brain development is under stress. And when, as a mind move instructor, the moment when I have a kid, or the kid can be 18 years old, and the mom told me that kid was a cesarean, or that kid was born before 38 weeks, I know that we need to help with certain problems. So, <coughs> the head need to, the baby, let me just show you this picture, from six to seven months, Closer to the birth date, the baby turns around and the head needs to move out first. Otherwise, a body part can get stuck. So the baby turns around 
due to hormones that helps with it. Okay? And we have the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin, so oxytocin will start the contractions. Oxytocin will also help the breast milk to start to flow. Because when this baby is born, the milk must already be flowing. Yes, you see? The fetus, this contraction will be the onset of labor and the fetus will move in the direction of the cervix. Then, the head of the, the fetus will push over, open the cervix. I don't know whether you are aware of it, but there is a plug, a mucus plug that forms in the cervix. Uh, because it actually that mucus plug prevents pathogens to enter while the baby is in the, cerv in the um, uterus. So that plaque is not really to keep the baby in. Eh? It's to prevent pathogens to come in. And that, that dilation of the cervix will push out the mucus plaque and the amniotic sac rupture, so the water, and the label con will start to contract in full. Okay. Okay, yes. Now I want to move to the videos. <coughs> this is just a simulation. There you see dilation. Okay, I want to pause it there because you can think that the hip structure of a female, it needs to widen. Therefore, a female that is pregnant has more elastic joints and all over, all over the jo her joints is more elastic. And especially it is for here so that the hips can open so that the baby can move out there. And now look at the action of turning and like propelling itself out to move out. Now, that movement through the canal was what you talked about. All that movement caused such a dramatic impact on the nervous system that it like kicks on development. So a baby that is born with a cesarean, I'm going to show you a cesarean also, um, <clears throat> do not have that kick in development. And th those babies need to do those massage that I always show in the mind moves, especially when you were little ones from, from the top, they need to do that after birth. And that is why the Mind Moves Institute has, actually it starts with Baby Gym. Baby Gym is our Mind Moves for babies that is just being born. And they help with all these little things that, may, yeah, you have to do that. They even stop reflux stop reflux, and lots of little things that young mothers have lots of difficulty with when a baby is born. The mind move, the, the baby gym instructor helps you through all of that, not only to help the baby to have a nice, pleasant environment, but to help with the development of the brain. There's lots of brain development during birth. Okay, so let's continue. <coughs> <coughs> so, did you see the placenta was like a little disc there at the back? That placenta needs to come out 
afterbirth. We call it the afterbirth. And in cattle, like cows, we normally see that bloody part that's lying there. Now, okay. And sometimes they eat it because there's lots of nutrients and, yeah, they also eat it. Yes.